most of us are very familiar with this passage as it is the very beginning of Christ's ministry. This will be the sixth time that I speak of it to you here in the sanctuary. But the beautiful thing about Holy Wisdom, Holy Scripture, is that it is so multi-layered, multi-dimensional, that each year we can discover a new element in it. There is so much packed into this seemingly simple narrative, so much teaching, that year after year we can find something new. This year we're going to take it from a particular angle. Imagine this now, across the Galilean countryside, a, a place where prophets have walked, holy men and women have been for millennia, a place of wonders, a place of tangible sense of the sacred. Here comes one who is more astonishing than everything that's come before. And even without mass media communication, the word spreads everywhere because they are so amazed at his words, at his teaching, at his authority, at his healings, at all that he brings. Something incredible is happening. Then we hear the words, when he came to Nazareth. When he came home, here is where it becomes up close and personal. No longer a story about him in the first century. A story about our human condition. I've said it before, but it's always worth repeating. One of our greatest obstacles in having a full life, which is our birthright, which is the good news revealed by the great teachers, is that we gravitate towards taking everything for granted. We take this moment for granted. We take breathing for granted. We take the sky for granted. We take our loved ones for granted. We take God for granted. So we, just like the folks at Nazareth, when they are visited by this astonishing person, can only see the familiar and the obvious. You know the saying, the familiarity breeds contempt. That's a very dangerous, treacherous hole to fall in. Let me tell you why. One of the most beautiful things I see in life are people who've been together for decades and decades and still appreciate and love each other. They don't take each other for granted. They still see what is wonderful. And we who come to know each other in one way or another, after a while, familiar face, first impressions crystallize. We don't realize that spirit, that the uncreated, can give us a word, give us a sign through anybody. We've lost that capacity to be responsive in the moment to the mystery and wonder that we all are because we take even ourselves for granted. And I beg of you, before it is too late, while we're still on the journey, let's rediscover some of that wonder. As Christ himself says, you must become like little children. Not silly and naive, not in a world like this one, that's for sure, but still able to break out of the box and to enjoy the wonder of the simple moment, the wonder of friendship, companionship, all the beauty that God wants us to have. We are meant to be happy. And so our first mistake is to fall asleep in taking it for granted and no longer hear the dynamic immediacy of spirit speaking to you right now through me that you've seen so many times, you're familiar with, something new can come to you. If you are responsive, if you're listening with a spiritual ear, not to me, but what to, to what God can bring to you. All of us are instruments of such blessing to each other. And here we have the paradigm that the master himself comes home and is unable to heal. He's done marvelous things throughout the countryside. He comes home and his people who know him from youth cannot see him in a new way, cannot be present to the holy within him. Now think of this. This is a metaphor saying that Christ cannot heal you just like he couldn't heal at Nazareth. If we think we've got it figured out, if we've parked it on a shelf, if we're not open to the new and the wonderful that is possible at any age. So let's try to be open today. I'll quickly go through what you've heard before. That mission statement, when he's handed the scroll and he opens it, 
He just opens it and there it is. Isaiah 61, the promises of God. I say to you right there is another teaching. Many of us, no doubt, have had those moments when you open the right book just at the right time. When the right word has been spoken to you at the right time. Surely, you know, surely somebody here has had that experience. My life is built on that. And it's offered to us all the time. It's just that we are blind to it. And so it's no coincidence that it opens to Isaiah 61. And then we run into the next obstacle, and that is tragically taking it on the surface, literally. The Spirit of the Lord has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. Since the 19th and 20th century, since rationalism has taken over, many have assumed the poor over there financially. When this is directly aimed at you and me, because that word poor is anawim. And you find in the Old Testament the definition of that word, whose root is anawa, which means humble. And so I show you today that the Master came to give us a breakthrough revelation, which is part of why they got so angry at him. This in the Psalm 69, the anawim, the poor will see and be glad you seek God. Poor in this instance is poor of conceit, poor of self-righteousness, poor of anger, open, empty, dependent on God. We find it again and again. We find it in Zephaniah. Seek the Lord, all you humble, all you anawim, who do His command. And finally, attached to, they shall seek refuge in the name of the Lord, the remnant of Israel shall do no wrong, nor shall a deceitful tongue be among them. And they shall lie down and no one will make them afraid anymore. The purification of a remnant. So this is good news to every one of us who has some yearning of some kind that we can't define about the spirit. May that be all of us. For some it's buried more deeply. For some it clashes so badly with the rational mind we just can't deal with it. For some, we run away from it. All of us hunger for that connection with the infinite, the source of our being, the source of our true fulfillment. And to begin to make that connection, to begin to be empowered by that knowledge of the companionship, perfection, and guidance of the Holy, we have to be poor in spirit. Release to the captives. I love the magnificent poetry of Isaiah in chapter 47 saying the same thing, claiming freedom to those in the dungeon who live in darkness. Think about it. The dungeon who live in darkness. Don't you think that if you are unhappy and worried all the time, you're living in a dungeon, a dank, dark place that is misery? I was a little boy in France, exposed to French history in first grade. Very traumatic. They had something that we learned about called les oubliettes. I mean, the forgotten places. That's where the king put his enemies. He forgot them in a dank hole somewhere. Horrible. Terrible. What I'm saying to you today is that we do this to ourselves. We cut ourselves off so much from the light, from the sacred and the beautiful, that we become our own oubliette, our own dungeon locked in ourselves, unable to break out, which is why we have so many unhappy faces in this world. That's why we have to understand this, you see. Liberty for the prisoners. It would be so easy if it was about the actual prisoners, and we honor the chaplains who care and love for those who are in prison. But we all know that it's not about let's let everybody go free, because that would not be a healthy situation. You agree? This is spiritual teaching at its most intense. We are the prisoners of our own attitudes and behavior. And the Holy One is trying to explode all that so that the promise of God that we could live fully and happily from our own truth. Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Today, you have the possibility to change, to get out of your own unhappiness to recognize that you are meant to be a being of light and joy and benediction to others. To recognize that who you thought you were in your bad attitude is a prison. And that the Messiah, the 
the Holy One come and take us out. I'll show you one more proof of this truth, and that is back with Isaiah in that chapter 61, when he speaks of those Anawim, he says, they, which of course means us, will be called oaks of righteousness. Can you picture the mighty oak tree in its deep roots? How powerful, how stable, how constant the planting of the Lord for the display of His splendor. Can you think about it? Maybe you've never imagined the possibility. We are all born to become the display of the uncreated one's splendor. We're not here to just get on the right career track, right? to make sure our retirement is taken care of, to follow all the different strategies the culture has for us. We are here to be a planting of the Lord, a display of His splendor. Can you imagine if a few people, each and every one of you, were a display of God's splendor? You would bring a light to somebody else's life. Miracles in the ordinary just by being that peaceful, joyful person. But what happens? They reject him. They say, hey, you're Joseph's son, Joseph and Mary. How dare you talk like that? How dare you bring such new ideas to us? Make us uncomfortable. Take us out of our comfort zone. Who do you think you are? And in spite of all the good that he's already done, already shown and proven, even though they've known him since childhood, know his family. These religious people who will not let go of what they think religion is, take this holy man to the top of the hill for the purpose of throwing him off the hill. Now that's a powerful picture. A religion that has no goodness in it, that has not been transmuted by the revelations of the Christ, is a dangerous thing. Where's the mercy? Where's the goodness? And don't you see that wasn't back then, that's right now. We're always in danger of crystallizing into a religion that would kill the Messiah, even while waiting for his appearance. And then another teaching. A fanatic crowd, a raging crowd, so fanatic about their religion. And instead of throwing him off the cliff, he walked through the midst of them in peace. Try to imagine. He was so centered in peace. He radiated such powerful, holy peace that these violent, angry people had to back out of the way and let him go. That's a teaching, friends. In fact, that is the root source of early Christianity teaching on Hezekiah, inner tranquility. And I suggest to you, next time you're in a group, in a conference and whatever gathering of people, if you are that person of peace, you have the power. No matter how ugly it gets, no matter how full of conflict the environment is, if you keep your peace, don't let them steal your peace, you will walk unharmed to the midst of it. There's yet one final teaching. Because he is rejected, not just a Nazareth, but every time we reject, we're choosing to go against it. Good. by choosing to gossip and slander, to be mean-spirited, to let ourselves behave any old way. Every time we reject the Christ, He walks through the midst of us and goes on His way. Another translation is, goes away. What does this mean to us? Listen now. The Holy Spirit relentlessly tries to reach you, and you relentlessly reject it, and will not allow yourself to be humble enough to receive something of it, to be sensitive enough to recognize where your errors are so that Holy Spirit can dwell with them. Eventually, it shakes the dust off its feet and moves on. And that's a metaphor, not that God ever wants to move away from you, but it cannot get in. We lock it out. And that's why so many churches die off, so many people end up so unhappy. They keep rejecting this reaching out. They keep saying no to that which is yes. They keep turning to the darkness instead of the light. So let this teaching be a now teaching, because now is the moment to make the choice. There is no neutral ground. Is the Holy One, the one that reveals the pathway to true life, to good life, to fulfillment, to joy, to your right destiny? Or do you just want to get rid of it? and go your merry way and easy. This is our choice today, as it was in Nazareth. And the consequences 
ಕಾಸ್ಮಿಕ್ 